Good evening, everybody. Let's try it one more time. Good evening, everybody. There we go. We're all awake. I like it. How many of you guys, um, how many fathers do we have? Raise of hands. Any fathers? Happy fathers. Wow, that's, that's pretty much every guy in here except me. I'm not a father. And uh, happy Father's Day to all of you. And thank you for coming to church. How many, um, I know this was the case with my dad and I, had too much to eat on Father's Day. Anybody? That was us. We had a great meal. And then uh, I did the mistake of having dessert. And it was, it was what put me over the top. And uh, so you'll have to help me sing out tonight um, to cover all these songs. So that way uh, we stay awake. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Friendship with God Fellowship. Thank you for joining us online if you're online. Um, we love having you guys check us out online, so thank you for that. We're going to start by singing a few hymns to get things kicked off tonight. So please join me in standing and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and begin with What a Wonderful, What a Wonderful Savior tonight as our first hymn. And we'll go from there as we sing now to the Lord here on our first verse. Christ has for sin atonement made what a wonderful Savior we are redeemed the price is paid what a wonderful Savior what a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Excellent singing tonight to start us off. You know, I think um, not only God is no longer just addressed as God, you know, he's not just um, like people uh, in, in the Old Testament, especially he was, he was just God Almighty, you know, and then you look a little bit more in the progression of things throughout the Bible and history, and then you get to see that he's not just God Almighty, he's God my friend. And then he's not just God my friend, he's God my Savior, and he's God my Father. And to have that, that relationship with him is, is something that um, on Father's Day I think is, is extra special. Uh, to think of how much more uh, a good gifts our Father who's in heaven wants to give to us. And um, he said in that last hymn, the writer wrote, he said, uh, He gives me overcoming power and triumph in each hour and um the father 
wants to give us, like in, uh, in, in Bible times, the custom was, you know, and today it's similar but not quite as prevalent, you would be an heir to something of your father. So your father, everything he owned became yours once he passed or once you were of age and you would get everything that was his. And even today, we might not get material things as an inheritance, but you get a lot of his personalities from your dad. You get maybe the same hair color as your dad or the if your dad has bad eyesight, you get bad eyesight from your dad. Um, those things and you become uh, inheriting of his qualities, his characteristics. And God wants that to be true of us. Everything about him, God says, you're made in my image. I want you to be like me, the Father. And uh, I've created you to do so, and I've empowered you to have that. I've given you all authority, he says. We're going to sing our next hymn, The Perfect Lamb, a beautiful, beautiful song. I think you'll enjoy it if you've not sung it before. A little bit slower. So on the first verse, here we go, The Perfect Lamb. Deep within his loving heart, God knew that sin would have to die. Out of love for me and justice plead, a perfect lamb was his reply. He laid aside his royal robe to rescue my eternity. singing um, and a great thought tonight and I I think it just matches well with um, tonight's theme as well and everything that we've been studying the last few weeks about the Lamb of God and his blood um, that we no longer have to sacrifice a lamb like they did in old times I was talking to two men who came up to me this last week earlier in the week and it was just an incredible unusual experience two guys came up to me and they were saying um, it was a new religion that's out and they were promoting it and one of the things they said is we still have to observe all the things the Old Testament Israelites did um, and they, they weren't Jewish or anything and uh, and they said we have to do that in order to be right with God and you know I said well what about sacrificing a lamb and they were like well you know they didn't really have the sure answer and I was like you don't have to do that you don't have to go um, do the, the sacraments and the feast things that, that were required of the Israelites because it was paid once for all by the perfect lamb, by his blood we're atoned. And so uh, praise the Lord, we don't have to live under um, the law anymore. Uh, tonight we're going to sing one more song and then we'll get to our announcements and testimonies of some things tonight. Saved, saved, saved. Um, and this one, if you notice has an exclamation point after every saved. So with exclamation point power, let's sing that out um, here on this first verse of saved, saved, saved. Here we go. Saved, 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 my sins are all forgiven. Christ is mine, I'm on my way to heaven. Once a guilty sinner lost undone, now a child of God saved through his son. Saved I'm saved through Christ my all in all. Saved I'm saved whatever may befall. He died upon the cross for me. He bore the awful penalty. And now I'm saved eternally. I'm saved, saved, saved on the second. Saved, saved, saved by grace and grace alone. Oh, what wondrous 
love to me was shown. In my stead, Christ Jesus bled and died. Born my sins, for me was crucified. Saved I'm saved, through Christ my all in all. Saved I'm saved, whatever may befall. He died upon the cross for me. He bore the awful penalty. And now I'm saved eternally. I'm saved, saved, saved on the last. singing you may be seated and uh some of you guys like me are probably out of breath after singing all these great songs we're going to come now to our time of announcements with jason here we go welcome to friendship of god fellowship and happy father's day as christian was mentioning we're glad that all you fathers would spend this evening with us in worship and uh just getting to know the lord more and uh just for the great job that you guys have done Throughout the whole year, we have a hundred grand for you after the service. So all you fathers get a hundred grand, and we also like to give you a gift. Uh, uh, this is written by uh, Tom Canner. It's called the Dedicated Father. It's actually eight uh, eight steps in the book of uh, uh, not the book of Philip, but the, the life of Philip that we can all look at as fathers as being godly fathers. Um, it's a wonderful book for you, and we'd like you to take one of those as well. So please uh, get one of those from Glenn uh, when you depart this evening. But we're glad you're here tonight. Do we have any new folks joining us this evening? All right, we got a couple. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring down a new visitor card. Please fill out one of those cards for us so we can get to know you better. You can also put your prayer requests on the back. And uh, if you'd like prayer at the end of the service, we, our staff is available for you up here at the end. So please come see us. And won't you also uh, open your bulletin now, and we'll go through the uh, this upcoming events coming up here at Friendship of God Fellowship. So we want to thank our food ministry. First of all, just thank you for that barbecue meal tonight. Barbecue sandwiches were delicious. Thank you, Joyce, and everybody that helped with that. Next week, we have our, our favorite food potluck, so please bring a dish. Uh, every 4.30 p.m. we have a meal here. It's a great time for fellowship, so please bring your favorite dish next week. We do have a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, that helps us plan a little better to see what we need to bring. So if you could put your favorite dish down on the, on the spreadsheet on your way out, we would love that. And then we also have our upcoming events, uh, 2018 Israel Live Summer Trips. How many of you are going to be joining us on a, on a future trip? <laughs> we got one up here. We have a couple of you back there. Okay. Well, th you don't want to, if, if you've never been to Israel or if you've, um, if you have been to Israel, this is a special way to go to Israel and really do it with an eternal purpose. And it's, uh, we've made it really easy. All you have to do is make friends when you go over there. So you go over, you make friends, all your, your meals are provided, uh, your land transportation and it's just a, an amazing opportunity to do short-term missions. So if you've never been on a missions trip, I highly recommend that you do this. Um, it's uh, a wonderful <laughs> time. to. Uh, Erickson's excited to do it coming up. And, uh, and kids can go too. So, so you can bring, you know, we, do, we don't uh, limit the age on that. Um, I mean, of course, you can't bring a, I'd probably say eight, eight and up is, is a, the, uh, the age range. And uh, we, we do do a lot of walking, three to five miles of walking a day. We go to a lot of parks, beaches, uh, go to malls. We go to a lot of um, different sites to, to meet uh, Jewish friends. So it's, it's a really 
wonderful way to, to go visit Israel, so we'd love to take you. I'll be going in November, God willing, and, um, and we'll be taking a lot of trips. But we do have availability on our August, uh, actually July 27th through August 6th, and our August 10th through uh, August 20th trips. So if you want to go this summer, there's plenty of room. And uh, we also have our Taste of Recreation on July 14th. That's uh, our ministry fundraiser. If you ha haven't signed up for that, that's also a wonderful way for you to support the ministries here. There's a lot of great food, a lot of great prizes this year uh, to auction off, and um, it'll be a wonderful way to, for you to see how you can help impact uh, the community here through this ministry and around the world. And we also have um, Frank Sherwin from the Institute for Creation Research will be joining us that evening. He'll also be speaking on creation, so don't want to miss that. And we have our creation fellowships every Thursday evening here at 6.30 p.m., and uh, that's a great way to meet, meet more friends and, and learn more about what we teach here uh, at the, the Creation Museum. So that's 6.30 p.m., and we're talking about the global flood here on Thursday evenings. That's all I have for my announcements. Christian will give us an update here in a little bit about the Summer Blitz. I want to continue to pray for the students that are out there. Uh, we have 75 students, 13 locations, and uh, they are uh, doing a tremendous job going door to door, uh, bringing the gospel message um, to the Jewish communities that we are um, living in this summer. So just uh, please continue to pray for them. He'll give you an update on that. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and continue to worship the Lord tonight through our offering. Uh, we don't pass the plate here, but we do have a drop box down the hall. You're welcome to drop your tithe there. And uh, won't you join me now as we uh, give thanks to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for allowing us to, to have this place um, just to, to learn more about you, to, to draw closer to you, and to uh, just to have community and to have fellowship, Lord. Uh, you're so good to us, Lord. You, you're a Heavenly Father, Lord, and our Abba Father. And we thank you so much for uh, being our daddy, we thank you so much for uh, what you did for us, Lord, on the cross, and we thank you for sacrificing your life for for us and for our sins, Lord. No greater uh, thing could be done other than that, Lord. And we just thank you for having victory over death and and um, allowing us to um, have that eternal relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you so much for all the fathers tonight. We pray that you would bless them that they would be encouraged, that you would give them strength, that you would help them uh, continue to guide their children, Lord, uh, in, in the way of your your word, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to bless each and every one of them as they are uh, spending this evening with us. And we're so grateful for all the fathers here. And we uh, we thank you for the, the message that you're going to bring tonight. I pray that you bless Mr. Canner and, and the message and continue to uh, teach us through your word. And we also want to lift up all the summer blitzers, Lord. We thank you for what they're doing this summer, um, just uh, spending time sharing the truth uh, with the lost, Lord. I pray that you would give them strength, that you would uh, encourage them as well, and and just help them as they continue on the work this summer. Give them health, good health, and just uh, allow them to see you through um, through these people that they're reaching. And I pray for continued open opportunities for them to, to reach uh, your people. We just thank you so much for this evening. We we want to give the rest of this evening up to you, and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we are going to, by the way, before I start with this, if you're a dad um, and 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 you need some, some extra, um, you know, we got a hundred grand, so don't don't uh don't be don't be a, a stranger. Uh, Jason brought all the hundred grands just for you, Dad. So please uh please be sure to get that, and then you can go home and say I got a hundred grand, and uh, and hopefully that'll take care of all of our financial issues, right? Um, tonight we're gonna look at some testimonies. I have one specific testimony that I thought was um, on your prayer sheets, but it's not. And so I'll tell you about it at the end of these testimonies. And um, we're going to start by it. Now, if you haven't gotten one of these testimonies before and you, you, you want, this is week four. So if you'd like the other week, we have some of the, some of the bulletins, the, 
the paper's on the back table there if you'd like weeks one through three. Um, but week four, this is our testimonies. You can go home and read over these. At the back of the pamphlet is the prayer request. People who are mentioned specifically by name, you can pray for them, their needs. But we're going to start by, by taking a look at some of these testimonies that happened um, this last week across the country and the world. So in Argentina, to start off, one of our summer blitzers says, We made a visit to one of the prospects in the area named Once. Once, that was their name. We had a talk that lasted all afternoon, but finally the family of the prospect came to separate him and take him home. I received threats from relatives that they would call the police if I decided to insist on my friendship with the prospect. I'm happy that I could at least share the gospel to a Jew who was humble and receptive to what the word says. That was in Argentina. Um, in Brooklyn, someone said, Last night, someone dropped off, I thought this was great, a box of food from HelloFresh for us to cook. Today was an encouragement. The Jewish people in Rockway uh, Beach are very open to talk. Think about that. You're at the house over in Brooklyn, and uh, someone drops off a box of food for you to cook. So uh, how would you like that if you showed up tomorrow morning and opened the door and there's some groceries? That would be great. But um, that happened in Brooklyn. In Cleveland, they said, God gave us a beautiful day to be out on the field. And then we got the police called on us for the first time. But we were able to work everything out. Uh, didn't get to talk to many people, but we gave out a lot of material at the doors and praying for the people who read them to get saved. This next one in Franklin Park um, is pretty long. You'll see on, on your second page it's that really long block. Uh, but I'll just read part of it. It says, we had Jewish people following us, taking pictures, and throwing away the packets on every door we went to. And if you don't want to read the, pa the, the pamphlets, you can read the screens. I have it written here, too. Um, they say, I found it hard for me personally to see and to hear a Jewish person reject Jesus Christ more than even how a Gentile rejects Christ. And I had cried when the first door I knocked on in Lakewood rejected us the moment I said Jesus Christ. I was almost in tears when I asked the Jewish man who kept following us. I said, why are you throwing away the packets? And he said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. You know what you are doing is wrong. That struck me, and I almost felt discouraged, but my teammates all huddled up and encouraged each other, and we all smiled despite the rejections they showed against our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, think about that. There's one who I just read a few minutes ago. Their family said, you're not allowed to talk to them, and threatened the people who were talking to them. And that individual whose family members came and snatched them away, um, they, they're... they're they're, they're holding them prisoner um, to the tru uh, from, from the truth. And, uh, and it's sad how uh, when the Bible says you'll have to reject your father and mother if you want to, to, to follow me. In some cases, these people literally have to say, I hate my father and mother in the parents' eyes because their, their parents are so protective and say, you're not even allowed to talk to them. And like this person said, it, it becomes to the point these Jewish people will grow up and say, I'm not even allowed to talk to you. What a statement. Um, in Houston, someone said, we didn't have a lot of positive contact, but we did find out through a Jewish friend that they started posting about the program on Facebook and warning other Jews about us sharing messianic, in quotes, messianic trash. Uh, and word gets around fast in those communities. And uh, so pr please pray for our summer blitzers. These are the things they go up against. In Israel, someone said, pray for Ami. He goes to the, he's going uh, to the States for work, and God has been drawing him to go to a church. He's very interested and has many questions. Pray that he would believe on Jesus the Messiah. Also in Israel, someone said, I met a Jewish lady who just so happened to speak Spanish and was able to have a long and good conversation in Spanish, uh, was able to present the gospel as well. She didn't accept but look at this. She did welcome us back to continue the conversation. She even cooked some food for us. So the moral of the story is uh, find people who speak Spanish and learn Spanish because they're extra friendly when you speak their language. Um, in Miami, they said, Today, I had one extended conversation with a Jewish man. And as I explained to him the love that God has for him, and I shared with him how much we love Israel and when I read the Old Testament time and time again, I said, I see God's love for his people. And even though in the Old Testament they were under the law, I could still see God's grace and mercy. Look at the next part. He began to get a watery eye, and before I could convince him to take the packet, he said, 
Thank you for your kind words. It's truly amazing to see God's love, but, but I'm Jewish and I can't believe in Jesus. My heart sunk as I thought of the phrase in the Bible, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian, King Agrippa. He didn't give me a name, but I'll be praying that something I said, I like this phrase, will place a pebble in his shoe. Um, what a heartbreaking statement. He says, thank you for your kind words. It's amazing to see God's love, but I'm Jewish. It's like everything you said was just, it made a lot of sense. It, it, it's incredible to see your life even reflects that, but I can't because I'm Jewish. Pray for those Jewish people across the country, around the world. One other name that's not in your book, uh, your, your pamphlet there, that I want you to keep um, on, on the front of your mind is a man named Raymond, Mr. Raymond. He's not in your pamphlet, but I got this, uh, this testimony from one of our guys at the HQ over in Lancaster said, um, Mr. Raymond, who's living in Miami, he's half Jewish, half Italian, grew up in a um, in a Roman Catholic slash Jewish home because of the parents uh, being different different cultures and things. And the mom was a Gentile who, through Catholicism, mentioned Jesus Christ. And uh, so he, he kind of heard about Jesus and all this stuff. He's a grown man now. And um, earlier this week, he was talking with one of our summer blitzers, Raymond was, and this half-Jewish, half-Italian man got saved. And so uh, the, the, the team over there in Miami was just in absolute um, elation over that. And that's great to, to hear something like that happening and we, and we getting to hear about that um, here back home about what's going on in Miami. And I thought that was, that was amazing. We're going to go to our hymns. Before we do sing this last hymn, I just wanted to share something that um, the Lord gave me this morning and I was thinking about it and I thought maybe it would be a help to you. And the phrase is this and as we sing this song I want you to think about how this can apply to any song you sing how it applies to anything you say anything throughout this week tonight tomorrow this next month or year um, and the phrase is this if you have a need and here's the rhyme sow the seed s-o-w if you have a need sow the seed and every word you speak you are planting seeds with your words uh, if you could imagine your voice as a gardener and your life as the garden, what you speak, you are planting in your garden all of the fruits and all of the weeds and all of the plants and all of the thorns and thistles with your words. And many times, um, how many of you guys love, uh, let's say, a fruit apple, like apple pie? You can do a lot with apples. If you love apples and you don't have any, what are you going to do? You're going to plant an apple seed to grow an apple tree. If you love oranges for orange juice or whatever else, you plant an orange for oranges and an orange tree. If you love pomegranates, it's my favorite, uh, wink, wink, in case you have pomegranates, and uh, you plant pomegranate seeds, you grow pomegranates. If you, if you need love sow the seed of love into somebody's life. If you need encouragement, sow the seed of encouragement into somebody's life. If you need faith, here's this one, sow the seed of faith into somebody's life. I'm believing with you something's going to happen. If you need hope, sow the seed of hope into somebody's life. You guys getting it? Unfortunately, we have a lot of discouragement sometimes, guilt, fear, doubt. Why? Because we're sowing those seeds and that's what we have as a result growing in our, our gardens. If you need a perspective on life, check this out. Sow the seed of worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will grow that garden to give you a beautiful perspective on life. As we sing, arise my soul, arise. Sow the seed of worship. And guess what? the garden of, of worship is going to begin to bloom in your life. You'll, you'll begin to see those things. So if you have a need, sow the seed. That's what I want to just leave you with. We're going to sing our last hymn, and then our message will come up right after that. This is a new hymn maybe to some of you. Fantastic words. So we'll sing it a little slow. Hopefully you'll pick it up as we go. Here we go on the first. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy gift. Surety 
stands. My name is written on his hands. My name is written on his hands. And think about the words as we sing the next few verses here on the second. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, His precious blood to plead, His blood atoned for all our race and spring. singing tonight you guys have done great thank you at this time we're going to dismiss our children to children's church with miss june looking forward to that and uh tonight for maybe our last part in this message i'm excited about that and uh if you got in your packages uh, a sheet of hymn music um hold on to that it's going to be coming in handy in a minute so um get ready for our speaker mr tom Cantor. hey praise the lord Boy, are those, aren't those hymns fabulous? I mean, they're just uh, just something you want to sit there and just think about. That last one, forgive him, oh, forgive they cry, nor let that ransomed sinner die. That's what the Lord says. And how about that one where it says his, his, his arms were, were outstretched and his blood flowed down which is really the subject and the topic of what we're discussing here, what we're studying here tonight. Tonight, uh, happy Father's Day. It's June 17th. June 17th, Father's Day. Kind of important for me because it was June 17th, 45 years ago. Um, that was a triple header for me. Uh, it was, first of all, Father's Day. That's when I became a father. My firstborn son was born on Father's Day on June 17th, 1973. It was also the day I graduated from UCSD. Went to church that morning. My wife sat down in the pew, started talking with the ladies there in church, and started to talk to her about her bag of waters that had broke. And the lady said to her, oh, you need to go immediately to the hospital. And my wife said, oh, no, Tom's graduating today. I have to go to the graduation ceremony. <laughs> so off we went, and that was the grand day. So happy Father's Day. Um, <clears throat> let's pray. Father, thank you so much for... Your word, help us now, Lord. You, your name, Lord Jesus, is Wonderful Counselor. And Lord, we are your patients this morning. We've come to your office for counsel, for wonderful counsel. And so, Lord, through your word, give us the wonderful counsel, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Uh, Hebrews 13.20. Please turn to Hebrews 13.20 as we, as we continue here. Uh, Christian said, maybe the last message. I'm thinking, does he know something I don't know? <laughs> anyway, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. This is, uh, I think, the last message. Maybe the Lord doesn't think so. But anyway, uh, this is our message on Behold the Blood, number 11, our 11th message. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Okay, so here we come. We come to our 11th message on Behold the Blood. It's taken us, we've started at the foot of Mount Sinai there when Moses was in front of all of the people and he sprinkled the altar. Then he sprinkled the people in Exodus 24, 8. And he said, when it says there, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Behold the blood. That's been our series. Behold the blood. That blood of those animals, it spoke of the coming blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which made great accomplishments for us. And that's what he was referring to when he died on the cross. His last words in John 19.30 was when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar... John 19.30, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When he said it is finished, he meant it is accomplished. It is accomplished. And he was referring to all that his blood accomplished. His blood accomplished for us the removal of all of our sins from Hebrews 9.22. His blood accomplished for us the redemption of our souls from 1 Peter 1.18 through 19. His blood accomplished the covering, the atonement, of our sins from seven, Leviticus 17 11. His blood accomplished our reconciliation with God. What we were just singing about, we are reconciled to God from Ephesians 2 13. His blood accomplished the cleansing of our souls from 1 John 1 17. It accomplished our peace with God. The war's over from Colossians 1 20. Our justification from Romans 5 9. Uh, the making of our robes white, wearing his robe of righteousness from Revelation 7, 14. Our sanctification from Hebrews 13, 12. Our overcoming, we were singing about that from Revelation 12, 11. The boldness that we now have to come in before God from Hebrews 10, 19. The covenant from Luke 2, 22, 20. Our protection from Exodus 12, 13. That's quite a list. That's quite a list of what the Lord accomplished, what he meant when he cried out in John 19.30. It is accomplished. And now we're going to see one more of the accomplishments of the blood of the Lord. And this is from the verse here that we were reading here where it says that the Lord, that, 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 that God was brought again from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's an accomplishment. Bringing again from the dead, or what was called the resurrection, the resurrection. His blood accomplished that. It accomplished our bringing back from the dead. And that's what we're going to see from this verse in Hebrews 13, 20. So here we go. Now, first we are told who is responsible. Who is responsible for this resurrection through the blood? And the answer from Hebrews 13, 20 is it's the God of peace, the God of peace. What a wonderful title for God, the God of peace. What does it mean, the God of peace? Well, first of all, of all the titles for God, and there are many of them, many titles for God, but of all of them, the God of peace is the title of hope. It brings us hope. Because, the God of, because there is the God of peace, there's great hope. And when God is called the God of peace, that means that God is the author of peace. He's the author of peace. Now, our problem our problem is that sin destroyed peace with God. It just destroyed it. That's what happened to our first parents when they were Adam and Eve, when they sinned, their peace with God was gone. It was destroyed. Now, I, I want you to sort of get a picture of this. I want you just now to kind of play along with me here a little bit and just picture four persons. Four persons. Two are on one side and two persons are on the other side. And on one side, we have a person named Mercy. That's his name, Mercy, Mr. Mercy. And then, and then also on the same side with Mercy, is this person named Peace, Mr. Peace. 
And then on the other side, we have a person named Truth. There's Mr. Truth. There he is. And then we also have on the same side another person named Righteousness, Mr. Righteousness. Okay, so we've got mercy and peace, and we've got truth and righteousness. And the thing, and can you picture that? Now, in the Garden of Eden, all four of those persons were just in perfect harmony. They were in unity. They were, they, they were together, mercy and peace and truth and righteousness. They just had a wonderful time together. They were great friends. They were inseparable. No problem at all. Then, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a great division. And after Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? Immediately, immediately, truth starts to speak and truth says, I'm out of here. He said, I live by the truth. And the truth is, is that Adam and Eve have sinned. And to say that, that they did not sin is not true. And I only live where truth is. And I'm leaving here because I can't stand to be here any longer. So as Mr. Truth, I'm demanding justice. That's the death of Adam and Eve. And I will not stay here any longer. And then what happened? Truth got up and he turned his back and he walked away. And not only that, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, Mr. Righteousness stood up and said, I'm out of here too. I'm out of here too. I, because I'm Mr. Righteousness. And what Adam and Eve did when they sinned is an offense to me as righteousness. Sin is the opposite of righteousness and I cannot stay here with Adam and Eve. And so as Mr. Righteousness, I demand justice, which is the death of Adam and Eve, and I will not stay here any longer. And righteousness got up also, turned his back and walked away. And that left, the, that left mercy and peace, and they were alone. And, 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 and they were watching Mr. Truth and Mr. Righteousness just walk away. And so mercy and peace were crying after them. They would say, stop, stop, come back, come back, don't leave, turn back. But there was no way. The truth and righteousness, they just walked away. And mercy cried out to Mr. Truth, Mr. Righteousness, please have mercy on Adam and Eve, but truth and righteousness said no. And peace, peace, Mr. Peace, he, he, he cried out, please, truth and righteousness, come back, make peace with Adam and Eve. But there was no way. That was a, there was a very sad separation between mercy and peace and truth and righteousness, and, 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 and they, 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 could, they could not be reunited. That separation and all this useless crying by mercy and peace for truth and righteousness uh, to come back, that, 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 that was the day. That was the day when there was a separation. That was the day. And what happened is that separation continued on for thousands of years until one day, one day, and that was the day we were singing about, one day when the perfect God's reply, as that song said, God's reply was the perfect lamb. One day the perfect lamb came, lamb came. That was the sinless Lord Jesus Christ. He took on himself the sins of man, including our sins, including the sins of Adam and Eve. He suffered. He died for the sins of others. And when that happened, mercy and peace now have a new argument for truth and righteousness. Mercy now cries out, Look, truth and righteousness. The perfect lamb has suffered. The perfect lamb has died and paid for the sins of all men, for the just, for the unjust. So now you can show mercy as, as, as truth and righteousness has been satisfied at the cross. And then peace cries out. Peace cries out and says, look, look, look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb. He's satisfied for sinful man. All the demands of truth and righteousness. He paid for the debts of all their sins. And then truth and righteousness turned around. They turned around and they came back to mercy and peace. And they met in, on Calvary's ground. They met on Calvary's ground. They met at the foot of the cross. And this was a great meeting, a great reunion, which took place and it's recorded for us in the Bible. In Psalm 8510, Psalm 8510, this is the record of the reunion of, 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 of truth and righteousness with mercy and peace, where it says there, first of all, in Psalm 8510, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I mean, that was a great reconciliation after thousands of years. From, and, and then in Psalm 8510, we can see Mercy and truth, shaking hands. 
good to be back together again. Righteousness and peace are so happy, they don't shake hands, they kiss each other. That was all because of the cross. The cross, the cross did that. Righteousness and peace could kiss each other. The cross happened all because of God having the title in Hebrews 13, 20 of the God of peace. He's responsible. Who's responsible for this reconciliation? It's God. You know, I remember after I, after I got married, to, I did the unforgivable sin. I married a Gentile. Oh, how terrible. But that's what I did. I married a Gentile, and that was the end with my marriage. With my, not with my marriage. It was the end with my family. It was my family. It wasn't me receiving Christ. It was me marrying a Gentile. And, and they just cut me off because you can't do that where I come from. My, my side of the railroad tracks, you can't do that. So anyway, so and I was pretty mad. I was pretty mad at my family, and I said, well, okay, fine. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll go and roll in the, in the University of, of Goyism, in the University of Gentilism, and I'll become a Gentile. That's fine. And, and that was my attitude. And, and, I was, and I, they walked away. I said, fine, I'll walk away too. But my wife said, oh, no. My, <laughs> my wife said, I married into a Jewish family, and into a Jewish family I will be. So she began to send gifts and presents. I say, why are you doing that? She sent me gifts and presents and love notes to my father and so forth. And we were reconciled. And then what happened is that when, after we were reconciled, my father, used, when we all used to get together, my father used to say, we're reconciled today. And he would point at me. He said, not because of you, but because of her. <laughs> you know what happened? Mercy and truth getting together, peace and righteousness. They could say, we're reconciled because of him because of the Lord Jesus, because of the God of peace. That was all because of the God of peace. He was the one responsible. Now, the Bible tells us what it means when God is called the God of peace. It's very wonderful. Because by calling the God of peace, we are saying that God is with us. God of peace is responsible for the Emmanuel, God with us. That's what it says in Philippians 4.9. Philippians 4.9 says the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace means that, that there is going to be a bruising of Satan. A bruising of Satan. That's given to us in Romans 16.20. Romans 16.20, which says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Shortly. By calling him the God of peace, it means to remove confusion from us. To remove confusion. It says that in 1 Corinthians 14.33. 1 Corinthians 14.33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. The God of peace is responsible for sanctifying us, separating us from this terrible sinful world. It says that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. He give, and not only that, but as the God of peace, he gives peace. He is the peace giver, according to 2 Thessalonians 3.16. 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always, by all means. And this is the peace that the Lord Jesus spoke about in John 14, 27. In John 14, 27, the Lord Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. This is a special peace that the Lord Jesus get, calls my peace. My peace. It's not as the world gives. What's the, what's the peace of the world? The peace of the world, peace from the world, comes when there is wealth when there is wealth as it says in psalm 52 7 look at how much money i got in psalm 52 7 this is the man that made not god his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches that's the world's peace when there is wealth the world's peace is when there is family family together that's what it says in psalm 17 14 psalm 17 14 it says from men from men of the world which have their portion in this life and then it says they are full of children and and then peace from for the world's peace comes when i've got a the christian was talking about giving an inheritance leaving it that's comes the world has peace when they say i've got a big inheritance i'm gonna pass it on i'm at peace now that's what it says also in psalm 17 14 psalm 17 14 they leave the rest of their substance to their babes they leave the rest of their substance to their babe. Peace in this world is all about how do you feel right now? How do you feel now? You feel good now? It's the present satisfaction. Again, Psalm 17, 14 says, they have their portion in this life. 
they have their portion in this life sometimes peace of this world also comes from planning for the future visualizing the future for example that's what the rich man did in luke 12 18 luke 12 18 when he said this will i do i will pull down my barns and build greater and there will i bestow all my fruits and my goods can you see him can you see him visualizing planning for his future that brings peace also peace in the world peace but the peace that the lord gives is totally different peace that comes from reconciliation peace that comes from reconciliation i asked a person this last week uh that that uh, uh i was able to buy a used lift for my uh for my pastor's widow and uh for her, her mobile home that she really needs she's 90 90 i don't know 91 92 i forgot but anyway she's in her 90s and and so i went down there to this mobile home bought this this uh this used lift off this guy and whose father had just died he was 72 had a massive heart attack and i said to him uh so what do you think about death what do you think that happens after death and he said after death he said that's scary it's scary god gives the freedom from scariness of death that's the peace that god gives why because he gives a peace from forgiveness of god forgiveness of god this is what's called a time of refreshing it's refreshing to the soul to finally know you're forgiven by god that's what it says in acts 3 19 acts 3 19 when the times of refreshing sh shall come from the presence of the lord we repent be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from from the presence of the lord from the presence of the Lord. He, he, the Lord was, uh, he was giving forgiveness of sins. We saw that in Luke 7, 48. Luke 7, 48, he said to a woman, thy sins are forgiven. Caused a big stir, caused a big uprising. That's what he said. But we're justified by faith, according to, to, to Romans 5, 1. There's also the peace that he gives from just a quiet conscience. A quiet conscience. See, there is no peace. There is no peace to the, to, to, in the world. As it says in Isaiah 48, 22, Isaiah 48, 22, there's no peace, saith my God to the wicked. In, in Isaiah 57, 20, Isaiah 57, 20, it likens, it likens to the, the no peace to the troubled sea. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, saith my God to the wicked. There's no peace, saith my God to the wicked. But peace comes from the cross. Peace comes from the cross, as it says there in Colossians 1.20, that the Lord made peace through the blood of his cross. And then there's a peace of having real hope, true hope, real hope, is what he was talking about in all of John 14, when he starts off and he says, don't let your heart be troubled. He said, he said in my Father's house are many mansions, and, 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 and I go and prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come and receive you to myself so that where I am there you may be also. That's peace through real hope in it to, of heaven. So God is called the God of peace. He's called the God of peace, which means he has a good hand. That's what Ezra called in Ezra, in Ezra 7, 9. Ezra said that it was the good hand of the Lord that was with him. What kind of hand is that? What kind of hand is the good hand of the Lord? Well, the good hand of the Lord, when you consider about Ezra, he was in a very dangerous situation. He was asking the king for permission to go back to Israel. This is a king that had conquered Israel. And now he was asking. Then as he traveled, he was going through enemies. There was a lot of danger. And so that's a hand that shelters. God's hand shelters. He shelters us, the sheltering good hand. So the God is the God of peace. He never loses anyone. He says, anybody who's in my hand, he says, there's no one that's going to get him out of my hand. No one that's going to get him out of my hand. Now, what we're told is that the God of peace brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful picture. He brought from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot read that without thinking back about what happened to the children of Israel when they left Egypt when they left Egypt. And this picture is given to us, and also Isaiah was thinking about that as well, when he wrote in Isaiah 63, 11, Isaiah 63, 11, Then he remembered he the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he? So 
what Moses is thinking of, what we're going to think of when we talk about the Lord, the shepherd, the great shepherd bringing up out of the grave is when the children of Israel came to that, ploy, that place in Egypt, the lower part of Egypt, just above Ethiopia, in a place called the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea. And there Moses stood, he raised the rod of God, the great wind came, the Red Sea parted, they walked across on dry land. They didn't walk on the water. They walked on the land, the land underneath the sea. And so there they are, as they could just imagine this now, as the children of Israel are walking along there on, on, uh, by the shore, and all of a sudden they're walking down and they're dropped below sea level. They're down there at the bottom of the sea, walking along on dry, dry land. They're looking at these massive walls of water here, and they're saying to themselves, we better follow Moses. And so I don't think this is the time to go astray right now. We can do that later, but not now. And so they're walking across there, and they're saying, stay close to Moses. Look at Moses. Stay close. Don't let him lead you up. Let him lead you out. Let him lead you. See? And here's this, and here, this is the picture. It's the picture of going down and then up and out, up and out. See, that's, this is what that's all about in that picture is going down and up and out, up and out. And the Lord Jesus went down into death and then up and out, up and out of death in the resurrection. And when you think of the children of Israel following Moses into the Red Sea and then up and out of the Red Sea, that's a picture of baptism. That's a picture of baptism because it says in Colossians 2.12, Colossians 2.12, we are buried with him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him. We are buried going down into the Red Sea, then up and out we are risen with him. That means when Moses led the people down into the sea, that was a picture of death or being baptized into death. And then when Moses led the people up and out, of the Red Sea. That was a picture of rising from the dead or coming out of the waters of baptism, the resurrection. And that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10.2. 1 Corinthians 10.2 says, they were all baptized unto Moses in the sea. That's what it's referring to. So we follow our great shepherd in resurrection, just as the children of Israel followed Moses up and out, of the Red Sea, and what happens as soon as the children of Israel came out of the Red Sea? What happened when they came out of the Red Sea? The Red Sea then crashed down on the Egyptians and killed them all. He killed them all. That's what happened. That's what happened there. He killed them all. He killed them all. And so when Moses brought the children of Israel up and out of the Red Sea, Israel was delivered from the wrath to come, the wrath that was right on their heels the wrath that was right behind them. And when the Lord Jesus leads us up and out uh, of death by resurrection, he will deliver us from the wrath to come. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, where we are told of his son from heaven, heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The children of Israel could just as soon say that about Moses. He led us up and out and delivered us from the crashing of the Red Sea, the wrath to come. By leading Israel up and out of the sea, Moses delivered them from the wrath to come. And by resurrecting us from the dead, the Lord Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. And now we come to the description of the Lord. The Lord Jesus is called in verse 20, that great shepherd. Not just the shepherd, but that great shepherd. That great shepherd. It sets, in a, it's, it sets us with the question, who are we? Who are we? We are described in Psalm 100, verse 3. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The sheep is his pasture. Psalm 23, 1, very famous. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, what does the shepherd do? What did Moses do? That shepherd that, was, that, that Isaiah referred to him in Isaiah 63, 11, what did he do? He led his sheep through, up and out of the Red Sea. And so the sheep follow where the shepherd goes. The idea here is that the sheep follows where the shepherd goes. That's the idea that the Lord is referring to when he said, as I quoted earlier in, in, in John 14, 3, John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to me, 
to, to receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So the sheep follow the great shepherd as he leads them. As it says in Psalm 80, verse 1, Psalm 80, verse 1, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Now, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us that the great shepherd was raised from the dead? Well, it means that we will follow him as, the, as Israel did, being raised from the dead, just as it says in 1 Corinthians 6.14. 1 Corinthians 6.14 says, God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us. In 2 Corinthians 4.14, 2 Corinthians 4.14 knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, by Jesus. Now, when we think about him as the great shepherd, there's two important points that we see. First, he is the great shepherd because he gave his life for the sheep. He gave his life for the sheep. That's what he said in John 10, 11. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He accepted, he, 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 his life, was, was accepted instead of ours. His dying made our dying no longer necessary. His life was adequate payment, just like we've been singing about. He's a great shepherd because he knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. John 10, 14, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and are known of mine. He's the great shepherd because he's tender. He's tender with the sheep. It says, and when it speaks about him with children in Mark 9, 36, Mark 9, 36, it says, he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him up in his arms, he said unto them, and he started, he told them that to let little children come to me. In Isaiah 40, verse 1, Isaiah 40, verse 1, very tender, it says, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. He shall carry them in his bosom, and he shall gently lead those that are with young. When he stood before Jerusalem, when he stood before Jerusalem, and he cried out in Matthew 23, 37, Matthew 23, 37, his cry was a tender cry. When he cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children? See, with outstretched arms his blood ran down. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? He's a great shepherd because he leads us. He leads us like Moses did. John 10, 4, John 10, 4. He putteth forth his own sheep. He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. He's just a great shepherd because he cares. You know, we sung before this hymn, Does Jesus Care? Yes, I know my Jesus cares. He's a great shepherd because he's a great, he, he cares. He draws an analogy between the hireling, the person who's just hired, and the shepherd in John 10, 11. And he says, the hireling doesn't care. That's why he runs away. The hireling, in John 10, 13, John 10, 13, the hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep, but not him. The, he's a great shepherd because he seeks when a sheep goes astray. He doesn't just say, well, I got all these, I got 90 and 9, well, what's one less? He doesn't do that. He gets compulsive, he gets obsessive. He says, I got to go after that one that went astray. He doesn't say, well, at least I have. No, he says, I want them all. In Ezekiel 34, 11, he says, in Ezekiel 34, 11, I, the Lord says, I, even I, will both search out and seek them out. I'll search out his flock in the day. And he's among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek my sheep. I'll deliver them. And then in, in going on in Ezekiel 34, 16, Ezekiel 34, 16, he says, I will seek that which was lost, just like when he came. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'll bind them up, bind up the broken. I'll strengthen that sick. I'll just dest dest destroy the, the, those that are against him. I'll feed my flock. And then Peter sums it all up so beautifully. When Peter says in 1 Peter 2.25, you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You were as sheep going astray, but now you return. Now you returned. I can't help but read that. When I read that, that returning that part, I just can't help but think of, of, of one of Jacob's son, sons called Naphtali. Naphtali. And, and when Jacob was on his deathbed and was going around, he said one sentence one sentence that said so much when he came to Naphtali in Genesis 49, 29, 21. Genesis 49, 21. Jacob looked at Naphtali and he said, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. 
Naphtali means struggle. I'm not going to go in to tell you how he got his name. It's embarrassing, but never mind that. Okay. Naphtali means struggle. And Jacob described Naphtali as a deer, a doe. Deers were never meant to be penned. They were never meant to be domesticated, and, and they struggle. And so he says, this is a, this is a deer that was struggling. It was, it, was, it, was in, it was penned up, and it was struggling. And one deer just struggled so much that, 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 it, that it got loose, and it went off. And, but, but the deer returned with goodly words. The deer returned with goodly words. You know, when I read that, I can't help but think about when we used to live in Lakeside on Willow Road, down the dirt road, way, way down the dirt road part. No one ever came down there. Where we lived with 300 goats. And we lived with, uh, we had a big family. We had 300 goats. And we had the worst property imaginable for goats. It was on the side of a hill with boulders. It was almost straight up and down. And the goats loved it. They just thought, this is wonderful. Big rocks and boulders in their pens. But it was, the, it was, it was just... It was, it was just a complete wrong place for us to buy. I'm sure the goats must have looked at us and said, how could you be so dumb as to buy this property for us? But anyway, it, 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 we, 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 we called out 10 uh, fencing companies, and, and we said, we want to fence that for pens. And, and they all said, you're crazy. I, we can't fence that. It's just one boulder after the other. So we ended up fencing it ourselves, drilled into rock with rock creek, put posts and everything. It was really something. Anyway, once in a while it would happen that the goat would, would get onto the, this large boulder and make this, this, this giant swan dive jump over the fence to the other side. And, 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 uh, and we would watch them do this, and they would jump for joy. And, you know, and then, and, uh, you know, I, I, my, my boys and I used to go up there and try to, to catch them, but oh, no. you know, I used to do that. That was 40 years ago and 150 pounds ago. But <clears throat> I did. But anyway... We'd see them jump over there, and they'd be skipping from rock to rock. Then up over El Capitan Mountain they went, and we never saw them again. They were gone. And I remember, well, the first time this happened, occasionally this did happen. I remember one time, uh, all of a sudden, you know, my boys would come in and say, Dad, Dad! You know, I'd say, what is it? He says, he says, one of our goats is outside the pen. And I said, well, he must have just jumped out. And we went out there, and by the, the ear tag, the number, we realized that that was a goat that escaped a week or weeks ago. And he came back. And he's standing outside of our pen, and he's crying. He wants back in. He wants back in again. So we'd go up there, take the fence apart, get the fence get, get back in, let him back in, and that goat never left again. Now, what happened? What happened to that one goat? There's very few goats that did that, some goats. Those very few, that minority of goats, what happens? Well, when that goat was in our pen, that goat had a memory, and she had water all the time in the heat of the summer. She had the most beautiful El Centro first cuttings of alfalfa hay, so beautiful. I used to go down there, grab that hay like a goat's mouth, and grab it and make like I was chewing it. No sticks would stick in you. Beautiful green smell, loaded with protein, wonderful. Then we used to go up to Ace grain up in uh, uh, Ontario there and we used to buy this sweet molasses grain oh it was wonderful stuff you know anyway and but and 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 when she was in captivity you know when she was at ki captivity she didn't appreciate it appreciate it she was a naftali goat she she just struggled with being in, in captivity and she looked for the freedom she thought oh it's gonna be so much better if I could just get out there on the other side of the fence and then when it got to be too much for her she made the great escape and, 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 and she was free. And, but then after time, she began to feel like the prodigal son. Came to herself. And she said, how much water did I have to drink in that pen? How much alfalfa did I have? How much of that wonderful grain? How many of my goat friends did I have in that pen? And, and she missed them. And she just came by. And then she was, just, she, she was crying outside the pen. And she had goodly words. Goodly words. And, and her goodly words were, please let me come back in. Uh, I miss being back in the pen. I won't jump again. Those were goodly words. I mean, if I knew goat language, I'm sure that's what she was saying. Now, some people are like that. Some people are like Naphtali. Some people are like that, especially when they're raised in a Christian home and where all they've known is the Christian home and the church, and they just feel struggling like Naphtali, they feel like they got to break loose. They got they're the hind let loose, as 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 Jacob said 
Genesis 49. The hind let loose. Naphtali is the hind let loose. And they go loose. They leave home and they get out. It's a prodigal son. They leave the church. They feel so liberated at first. It's, oh, the freedom is wonderful. I can do what I want to do. Go, be what I want to be. Go where I want to go. And, they, and life is wonderful. But then comes the road of hard knocks. And they find that out there the world is not what they thought it was. The world's cruel. And no one loves them unless what they give. They have to give. There's no such thing as unconditional love. And then they remember, oh, the love and the care that I received at home, just like the prodigal son, just like those goats. And they come back with the goodly words, I'm sorry for leaving. I was wrong to leave. Please forgive me. I won't leave again. And when they do, they're just like those goats that come back. And the Lord Jesus is the great shepherd because he opens up the fence to let them back in the pen again. He is the great shepherd that's described by Peter. You are returned it's like what Peter is saying, oh, you're the goat that's outside the pen. You returned again and, and to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. He is a great shepherd because he lets us back in. He is the great shepherd because he went to heaven first before us. He led us. He's leading us in, in Hebrews 4.14. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing that, that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast our profession. He's the great high priest because all of our needs... He supplies. Have you ever taken Psalm 23, Psalm 23, and, and dissected it out for what are the needs and what are the needs that he met? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That meets the need of our soul to be led. We are not good at making decisions. We need a leader. Moses, lead us up out of the Red Sea. Lord Jesus, lead me in life. The Lord is, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will not going to experience that soul hunger and thirst, that deep emptiness and void anymore. He makes me to lie down in, in green pastures. We need rest. We need peace. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He meets that need. Leads us beside the still waters. The still waters, that soul-satisfying still waters of the Word of God that we drink in. He restores our soul. Those reports that we had from the summer blitzers there, their souls were battered, they were damaged, they were in need of repair. And they go back and have their time with God, and God restores, he restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. As we mentioned here, he, he leads us into God's path of righteousness, corrects us when we need it along the way. We need it. We walk through the, the, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. He meets our needs to not be anxious. He meets our needs so that we don't look at death and say, that's scary, that's scary. And he does it through companionship, for thou art with me. Companionship and fellowship. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. We need comfort. Nobody knows the need of comfort more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in Psalm 69, 20, Psalm 69, 20, that reproach had broken his heart, that he was full of heaviness, and he looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but he found none. And so now he is the Lord in 2 Corinthians 1, 4, 2 Corinthians 1, 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies to boot. That means, uh, in other words, when our enemies are pounding on us, he especially pours out blessings. He anoints our head with oil. That would be speaking of the anointing of the oil would be as in sonship, like we were talking about today. Today is Father's Day. He makes us know we are sons of God. Our cup runs over. Superabundance. Superabundance. Never running out. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We just need to know that something terrible is not going to happen to us to tomorrow. He makes us know that because it's only goodness and mercy during our life. And afterward, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He makes us know that we have a great future. We have a great future. And it's all, it's that great shepherd that was raised through the blood. Now we're told how this great resurrection happened. In Hebrews 13 20 Hebrews 13 20 through his blood by the blood our sins killed him our sins killed him our sins weighed him down as the hymn says and it's, it's very scriptural when it says O Christ what burdens bowed thy head our load was laid on thee that hymn describes what our sins did to him they weighed him down but his blood took away those sins and freed both us and him 
from the weight of our sins. Our sins held him down. His blood broke our sins away from him and allowed him to rise up from the dead. That's what it says in Acts 2.24. Acts 2.24. God hath raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. The word holden of it means they couldn't hold him down any longer. They couldn't hold him down. I, you know, I, I, it, this, this reminds me when, as you know, a few weeks ago I was, when I was in Hawaii and I decided to go back into scuba. It had only been 50 years since I had died. <laughs> my last dive i didn't tell them that but anyway so i needed some new safety training because all this newer equipment you know since 1968 things changed a little bit and so at that time we wore weight belts but now there is a buoyancy control device I had to even memorize these words vents vest and the weights are sleeves that are tucked inside of the vest and so we went out in, in, into the ocean there with the, the instructor and I, and we did safety maneuvers so we could teach this. You know, so he says, okay, now if your partner gets in trouble then, and you're down at the bottom and you need to rise to the surface, then here's what you do. You reach over to your partner and you unsnap these quick snaps and the, and the weights will fall out of the sleeves to the bottom of the ocean. And so we did that. It wasn't very deep, so he could go get them again. Anyway, and then, and then you rise to the surface. What a picture, what a picture that is of his blood. The Father, God the Father reached over and unsnapped the weights on the, on the vest of the Lord Jesus Christ, which were our sins, and then he rose from the dead. Our sins were the weights that weighed him down, that kept him below, but his blood unsnapped the weights of his sins that held him down. And God saw this. God saw that the work of the substitution was complete. It was finished. And so just like we say, it was accomplished. And so God the Father accepted his work, and therefore he rose from the dead. His blood was the symbol of our death. His blood was the seal of the resurrection, the seal of the resurrection. No blood, no resurrection, just that simple, just that simple. His resurrection was not part of the work. It was the result of his work. That's why we're finishing up the series now with the resurrection because for all that we have discussed of what his blood accomplished, this and this and this and this, it's in your bulletin. It was the resurrection that was the result of all his work. The resurrection, the, the resurrection was God's, God's doing after he saw all the work that he did. It was just like when, when, when God looked down and saw all of his work, he said, that's good. When God looked down on Noah and saw that his sacrifice, it says God smelled the sweet savor. He smelled the sweet savor, and that's what God did. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is called the blood of the everlasting covenant. Why? Because the, that covenant, that agreement, was formed back in the councils from eternity, and it will last throughout all eternity. As a matter of fact, whenever we at Scantabodies get a new contract, the first thing we go look at is way at the end, it's called the term. In other words, the duration of the contract, how long this is going to be in effect for. Well, God's contract is, his term says everlasting, everlasting, as it says in Jeremiah 32.40. Jeremiah 32.40 says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. <coughs> now, Finally, we can add the 14th accomplishment of the blood of the Lord Jesus. It's the accomplishment of our resurrection. But really, this last accomplishment, as I mentioned here, is the result of all the other accomplishments. It's the, this is the resurrection. This is the graduation march. The Lord Jesus did all the hard work on the cross. And then when it came time for him to graduate, what happened is he turned to us and he says, you walk down the graduation because you're going to graduate in me in me after he suffered after he died he pointed us and he said i did it all for them i did it all for them they get to walk with me in the graduation march let's pray father thank you so much for the great work of our great shepherd the lord jesus all that he accomplished and thank you lord in the graduation that you resurrected him from the dead in jesus name amen That was wonderful. <clears throat> what a great series of messages. 
about the accomplishments of the blood and uh, amazing how God multitasks. His blood doesn't just do one thing. Um, we just learned about a lot of uh, 14 and and uh, many, many sub points within those points. Um, just a great series. If you would like to go back and check it out online, you can um, on our YouTube and our podcast there and listen to the messages and take more notes or re, uh, review your notes with those messages. I think that would be good um, for us to do. And uh, how, how about how um, Mr. Canner was mentioning um, the goat farm he had, and I'm just trying to envision goats like swan diving <laughs> over those fences. And then uh, some of us, you know, with our lives and um, God's fence of protection, and we swan dive over them, uh, how we must look, you know, how, must, how ridiculous that must look. Um, I'd like to see Mr. Canner go scuba diving. That would be something. How many of you guys would like to go scuba diving with him? That would be a lot of fun. Uh, and then he would just unclip my weights because <laughs> he'd see me flailing around underwater. Uh, that's what would happen. We're going to be singing one more hymn before we dismiss Nothing But the Blood. This is a little bit amended. The lyrics were actually written um, based off of the points from Mr. Canner's uh, series here. And at the bottom you can see the the there's seven verses because there were 14 points so um, part one of verse one part a of verse one you can see at the bottom the reference from his points to the hymn so uh, if you remember if you were here last week you heard him sing it and uh, we kind of followed along but we put it in hymn form we put it on paper so you can take it home or you can read the lyrics on the screen um, but these are the new lyrics for tonight singing nothing but the blood based off of this series the accomplishments of the blood so let's go ahead and uh, sing one last time if you wouldn't mind joining me as we stand and uh, after this we'll dismiss and then if you have any prayer requests you can come on up front and we will dismiss after this so seven verses 14 points great thoughts tonight here as we sing nothing but the blood here we go the blood of Jesus. Oh.
Thank you for joining us tonight at church. Thank you those who joined us online. Punch the person who's a dad next to you. Tell them happy Father's Day and have a great rest of your evening. If you'd like prayer, go ahead and come on up front. And thank you for coming to church.